Now, there's really kind of one major difference between a lot of our native bees and, say, a social bee, like the European honeybee. Now, of course, many of us know the honeybees were brought here in the 1600s by European explorers, and they're very different than the vast number of our, our bees. First off, honeybees, of course, live in huge hives, about 50,000 members in the height of the summertime. And because of that, they've always got thousands of young growing back home that are really desperate, in need of as much protein as they can get as soon as they can get it. Because of that, honeybees have developed what's known as corbiculi, or pollen baskets. And what that basically is, is their hind legs are kind of hollowed out, and there's a profusion of hairs that are shaped almost like a basket in those back legs. As honeybees land on a flower, they're constantly wetting themselves, packing the pollen that's all over their body into those corbiculi, or those pollen baskets. Now, these bees are incredibly effective at doing that. They can carry about 75% of their body weight in pollen alone. They're so effective at that that very little pollen actually falls off of the bee as it goes from flower to flower. So they're very efficient at holding on to that. It's very good for their, their hive because they're getting as much pollen as possible back home, but that efficiency is actually pretty bad for the flower itself. Because not very much pollen is dislodged as honeybees go from flower to flower, they actually don't pollinate as much as other pollinators do. Actually, for example, in many of our native plants, honeybees are as inefficient as 15%. It means they pollinate only about 15% of the flowers they land on. Honeybees also actually approach flowers differently than a lot of bees, especially if they're doing specialized jobs like gathering water or propolis out in the field. They will approach flowers in a way that doesn't kind of get them into contact with the reproductive structures. These two traits are very different than our native bees. First off, because many of our native bees are solitary, they don't have that need to cram as much pollen into their hairs as efficiently as possible, so many of our bees are kind of covered with really dense, profuse, almost afros of hair. Because of that, they're very messy at kind of traveling between flowers, and there's a lot of pollen dislodged as they travel from flower to flower. So, for example, mason bees and leafcutter bees, like this one up on the screen, pollinate 90 to 99 percent of the flowers they land on, both due to the way they approach flowers themselves and the way their hairs are located on their bodies. So these are the most effective pollinators known to science. Basically, by having these animals in and around a garden, you ensure that your plants are properly fertilized, which will give them greater fruit set, larger fruit set, and it'll just increase their genetic diversity, which really strengthens their uh, kind of resilience towards future stressors. Now, as I said before, about 30% of the 4,000 species of bees here in the States live in a dead standing tree that's been excavated by beetle larvae. And now, bees have a really interesting trait, and actually most hymenoptera kind of share this trait. They're what's known as haplodiploidy. And what that means is they can actually determine the sex of their offspring. Basically, for bees and wasps, and again, most other hymenoptera, an unfertilized egg turns into a male, and a fertilized egg turns into a female. And now, that's very important for these animals for several reasons. And now, let's look at kind of these man-made houses, just to kind of get a glimpse and talk through kind of the interesting life cycle that these solitary bees have. And so, in nature, these bees rely on very specific animals to drill very specific holes for them, but sometimes you can find man-made houses that have very specific diameters of holes that attract those same bees. And basically what happens in that life cycle is a female will emerge from her nest and she has adapted the ability to fly through a forested area, basically looking for these holes already bored in trees. So she finds a specially sized tunnel and actually these bees are able to use their antenna, just like honeybees, as a type of caliper to actually measure the diameter of that hole and help them determine that it's just right for them. Once they find the right hole, the female moves down to the base of the tunnel and the model that Jill is expertly holding there is kind of a cross-section of what's going on inside of these tunnels. And so, basically, she goes down to the bottom, she gathers a, a ball of pollen about the size of a pencil eraser, she lays an egg on top of it, and then she closes off that egg into its own little room. And now each species of bee uses different materials to make those partitions. 
So mason bees use mud and small rocks, just like a mason would. And leafcutter bees, if you couldn't tell by the name, use leaves. And some of them actually will go a step further, and they'll line the walls of that nest, like a wallpaper, with leaves to help keep out moisture, maybe some pest incursions as well. Now, each female is able to do that about 12 times per tunnel. And these females are only alive for about two weeks as adults. And so they're only uh, really able to fill normally about two of these tunnels in their lifetime. Then the adult dies off. After she's gone, her young hatch. They eat the pollen. They undergo a complete metamorphosis, just like a butterfly. They enter a protected pupil state, and they actually stay in the wood for the, the whole rest of the year. The same two weeks the following year, they emerge and just repeat that short-lived process. So again, the vast majority of both bees and wasps live very similar lives. And uh, as I was getting to, it's very important for these bees where they lay their males and females. And so these bees tend to lay the females towards the back of the tunnel. And as they get towards the outside, they start laying males. And that's for two reasons. First off, it's to ensure that any males have emerged already from the nest and are waiting for the females to come out so they can quickly fertilize them in an efficient way. But also, perhaps more importantly, if a predator were to break into these houses, chances are it would only get to the first couple bees, which would be sacrificial males. And of course, as most of us know, in the bee world, really, females do all of the work. And so unfortunately, male bees normally have to take that kind of sacrificial role. But you know, it's all right. And now, another interesting thing about these bees, well, this is a great example of how honeybees really have evolved these corbiculi, or these pollen baskets, on their back legs. I mean, you can see they're basically bell bottoms just stuffed with pollen. But you can see that the rest of their hairs are rather wimpy, kind of puny, almost crop cut or close cut the rest of their bodies. So again, they are OK pollinators, but generally honeybees get the pollination work done just through sheer numbers alone. For example, a lot of our mason bees can do the work of several hundred honeybees, each on their own, especially for early season crops. Another huge benefit of a lot of our native bees is they're active and working in much colder weather and much more inclement weather than a lot of other bees worldwide. So especially for some of our larger bees, which we'll talk about in just a minute, they kind of pick up a lot of slack in pollination, especially in cold weather, early season and late season, and so a lot of our early and late bloomers really rely on these bees for proper pollination. And now, so as you can see here, this is one of our more common wood nesting solitary bees. These mason bees, you can see they tend to kind of hold a lot of their pollen on the bottom of their abdomen, but they have longer hairs than the honeybee, and they tend to just belly flop from flower to flower, make them incredibly important pollinators. These mason bees tend to be more active early in the season, and their small size and dark color really helps them warm their muscles up in the sun. As all insects, bees are cold-blooded, so most bees actually can't take flight. Once the temperature drops below 50 degrees, definitely 40 degrees, it's too cold for them to actually physically move their muscles. And one kind of evolutionary adaptation that some of our native bees have is they're able to, through different methods, either it's warming in the sun or vibrating their muscles, they're able to actually heat themselves, either in, even in near freezing temperatures. They're able to heat themselves up to the point that they can actually get moving. So again, these are incredibly important pollinators for those really cold seasons. And now, when you do have either a man-made habitat or you see this kind of nesting situation out in the wild, it's relatively easy to tell what animal has made it. And again, you can see here, mason bees have kind of, up in this hole, closed off this hole using a variety of small rocks and mortar. Usually it's, it's sand or clay. And then, of course, the leafcutter bees have used that green uh, kind of paper mache almost for this species. And now, one other thing, sometimes in houses like this and in a dead standing tree in nature, some solitary wasps will live in a very same structure. Now, these are other beneficial animals. They're great pest control. They live a life very similar to our native bees, except instead of gathering pollen for their young, they're gathering very specific prey. And so a lot of those wasps are, are known as mason wasps or potter wasps, and they have very specific prey, usually very small caterpillars. And they live a very similar life cycle. They all live kind of uh, gregariously together. And you can tell the difference between a potter wasp nest and a mason bee nest 
because the potter wasps, for whatever reason, tend to take a little bit longer to kind of smooth out the clay on the outside of their nest. So it's just like the mason bee ones, except it's a very smooth, kind of fastidious nature. And of course, this would be the natural habitat of these bees uh, and wasps also in nature. And as you can see, all of these holes really have been riddled by a variety of mostly beetle larvae and other boring insects. And so when you see something like this in and around your property, I encourage you to leave it whenever possible. Even if you have a highly manicured space, you know, toss it to the fringes, somewhere where it can stay and offer. I mean, this is probably housing for thousands of animals. Um, so, you know, these are really, really profound, important nesting sites that unfortunately, these dead standing trees are the first things to be removed in most any urbanization project. And so uh, that is one bonus of these man-made houses. If you're in a very urbanized area, like the middle of a neighborhood that has no natural spaces nearby, these kind of recreate that dead standing tree in a nicer looking package. But there are some things that you want to watch out for. First off, you want to make sure uh, these houses are very easy to clean on the inside because every several years pests and diseases build up, especially in these man-made houses, and it's uh, really good for the bees just to switch out where they're actually living. But the more important thing is you want to make sure that any wood nesting bee house that you have is at least six inches deep. And now that's really important because studies have found that once these houses drop below six inches in depth, the females start laying more males than females, and that can really impact future generations. So these holes can be deeper than six inches, but you do not want them any shallower than six inches. If you found yourself in possession of a house that's shallower than that, which has bees in it, I encourage you just to get a better one, and chances are the next season, as those bees leave the, the smaller house, they'll pick the proper house, and then you can just dispose of that house at the end of that season. One easy way, and perhaps my favorite way, to tell you how to identify a bee is to look to the butt, or look at its abdomen, see what it's shaped like, how it carries it, and that can really tell you a lot about the bee itself. Now, here we're looking at a summer, uh, kind of more summer wood nesting bee. These leafcutter bees are probably flying around now already in this kind of mutant, uh, mutant year we're having, and you can see these kind of lush, enviable hairs on the bottom of this leafcutter's abdomen. I call it, it's kind of like a butt mohawk, if you will. And leafcutter bees really specialize in collecting pollen at the, at the underside of that abdomen. And so it's actually really easy to tell them apart from most other bees because not only is their abdomen really triangular, but they tend to hold it straight up in the air as they go from flower to flower in an attempt to try to hold on to as much as possible but because their, their kind of hairs are so profuse and enviable, uh, they are still pretty messy and they're still incredible pollinators, even though they do their best to, to hold on to it. 